The Google Gang Podcast. <laughs> really serious like violent outbursts and incidents yeah actually okay so this is really really bad okay um, let's start with the worst one and work our way back okay so i was on a double decker bus of four and seven mm-hmm. and i was just passing um on the road which leads down to clapham and it's like clapham park estate and we just heard bang and then just looked over and there's a dead guy Someone got shot on the bus? No, not on the bus, out of the bus. We were on oh, the bus. Right. We just looked over and was like, oh shit, and the bus driver went on. So We can't really stop the bus, can we? Like, once the guy's been shot, you yeah. know, that bus has got a timetable to keep to. If only Northern Rail could take a leaf out of that bus driver's book. TFL, man, like, you know. barely any strikes, and that's why. Because <laughs> <laughs> cats are getting shot in the street and nobody cares. It's not about like every, it's literally every man for himself, so like fuck him. Yeah, we've got commuters with places to go. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Is that like the craziest display of violence you've ever seen? Um, no. Uh, I was driving past Brixton tube station mm-hmm. and um, there was just a guy running around with a machete. Okay. And just sliced a guy. Okay. And there was just blood in the street and he was just lying in the bus station. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> you say it so matter of factly as well. I know, like... that's the worst thing. Everyone just goes because I, like, when I'm not on stage, I do speak up quite articulately. Mm. And they just go, I can't believe you've had that life. Like, and I just, I'm like, yeah, no, like, life has been kind of a bit crazy and dark shit has happened. Like, it's just. Do you not articulate when you're on stage? I try and be like a little bit more South London in it. Because otherwise, like sometimes I slip in and out, but otherwise no one goes and believes like, you know, about, you know, the police finding the dead body of my neighbour. That is a genuine true story, that bit. Yeah. No one believes it. So go, oh, you know, you sound middle class, you sound bougie. Yeah. You are bougie and middle class though. I just like social. It's gonna be the name of your episode, Bougie Middle Class, <laughs> featuring Scarlett Dobson. I'm just a social climber, man. What does that mean? Explain like, the social, social mobility. Climb. Like I started from the bottom and I don't wanna go back there. Okay. But why why do you think you started from the bottom? Because I grew up in Catford. Okay. <laughs> would you would you say that your your parents also started from the bottom? Uh, yeah, but their bottom was totally different. Okay, so it's a different level of different bottom. Different level, because my dad was uh, a child of the rations after the Second World War. Okay. In the ni- in like 1950s. So his like bottom level was bad. Yeah. And then he became... Post-war bottom. Post-war bottom. Yeah. And then he became... Whereas your bottom is like having to have breakfast at Greg's instead of prep. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was uh, all the popular kids uh, used to take the piss out of me because I had to actually buy my clothes in Tesco's and Lidl. Right. Whereas their parents brought them Lacoste. Okay. So. That makes sense. Is, is, is Catford quite an affluent area? On now it is. Okay. Like, genuinely, when I left, they had their first fringe festival, mm-hmm. their first little culture festival, and that pisses me off because... You know, I can't now afford to live there, the kind of life I get up here. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I grew up with crime. Mm -hmm. And now you're getting culture. You're kicking everybody else out who worked so hard to get that kind of life. You're kicking them out now. And you're going, right, everyone who, you know, can afford it, have it. It's yours. Yeah. And I worked so hard to be here. It's not fair, man. So, like, the people that were in that area worked hard to bring it where it is, and now they can't afford to stay. Exactly. Yeah. Now that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Gentrification <laughs> got me mad fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it is Scarlett Dobson, um, comedian, radio personality. <laughs> Um, have you done any acting or modelling? Yeah, I... Um, Add them to the resume. <laughs> I went to uh, the Brit School of Performing Arts and Technology. Oh, of course you did. Yeah. <laughs> but the, that's the thing. Whenever I say that, people go, really? I'm like, do I look not talented? Mm. Like, what's your fucking problem? You people... probably don't want me to answer that question. Again, please don't. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know my fourth favourite thing to do is rip shit out of you. <laughs> um, Hang on, what's the other three? 
Um, we'll go through them later. <laughs> has a lot to do with at-home extracurricular activities, you know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lighting fireworks in car parks is number five, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, number six is when you actually find, like, decaying pumpkins, put a firework in them, and then light them. Yes, good idea. It's so fun. <laughs> It's so fun. The perfect blend of Halloween and bonfire night. Exactly. In the one place. Mm -hmm. God, isn't England amazing? (laughs) (laughs) So you've moved up to the north of England from the south of London. Mm. What are the main differences that you've noticed since you've been here? It's fucking colder. Yeah. (laughs) How much colder though? Because I went to London and it's not warm. What? They've got pollution that keeps you warm. Mm. And like, I just want one... <laughs> I've never heard someone so hard on for global warming being like, the smogs keep me warm this morning. Fuck the polar bears. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, there's no polar bears at fucking, you know, Earl's Court Station. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what are, the, what are the main differences? I don't want to talk about the weather. I want to talk about the life. The, the lifestyle. You genuinely get a better one up here yeah like it feels so much more homely there is community you i'm not live i'm not working to barely survive i'm working to actually live a life yeah it's incredible so why do you think so many people are attracted to london it's just bright lights bright lights opportunity Mm. but then landlords and House prices and estate agents have just gone, yeah, fuck it. Everyone's like that. Look at supply and demand and they're just going to rip the dreams out of people. Mm. You can't you can't live a good life there. Yeah. Do you feel like as well, because it's, it's interesting for me because my auntie is from New Zealand, okay? And she left when she was about 24 to move to London. She's lived in London now for 15 years. And she has raised all of her five children in a two-bedroom house in London. And... I was talking to her and my uncle, and my uncle was saying basically, he feels like the kids would have had a different life if they had been raised in New Zealand, wide open spaces, they could run around, they could have had quad bikes, gone hunting, fishing, all that sort of thing. But he's like, I don't think they've had a bad life in London because they go to museums, they were there during the Olympics, like they've got to experience these different things. Do you feel like for you, if you were to have children later on down the road, you would want to be attracted to a big city or is the wide open space country life uh, i wouldn't even say manchester's country life yeah. but is that more appealing to you because you didn't have it i did you did have a country life i did life. have a bit of a country life so my granddad before he died uh invested in an old mill farm okay uh, in essex called pandan farm mill mm-hmm. with his then his wife at the time before he passed away and it became like an art sanctuary. So she did like artist tiles and stuff. But she had a farm on the side. So yeah. a lot of my childhood was spent on a farm as well. So you got a good balance of city yeah. and country. Yeah. Okay. Like, I'm, not, I'm not a bloody townie. No. <laughs> okay. I can milk a cow. <laughs> <laughs> I've touched a tea. <laughs> but what would you say would be a better environment that you would want to raise you know, a family in. As it all depends on the sit, like, what you know, the community to raise it in because you can like raise your kids in a like a wide open space like country living. Mm. But then I don't want them to be around bigots mm. because there's only so much culture I can give them. Whereas mm. a city can give them so much more cultural understanding. Yeah, that's so. that's that is exactly the same point that um that, that my family had was basically the things and the, like they go to a school and the school is so multicultural like mm. there's everyone from every background all over the world and they're just like that's just my friend and she's wearing a hijab you know and that's just normal whereas if you've got like say for example we've been to Blackburn a few times I'm the first person to admit Blackburn's a very interesting place Mm -hmm. an echo chamber of racism so to speak (laughs) Um, but the kids that go to school there if a kid rocked up and they had a hijab on or something that was very foreign to them it wouldn't it wouldn't be accepted or it wouldn't go down smoothly I mean the weird thing is about that gig they were being so racist homophobic sexist Islamophobic all the phobics you can think of. But when they were saying all those horrible things, I looked outside the window and I could see like 
a family of multicultural descendancy. And I'm just like, this area clearly does have diversity in it. Yeah. But, it just but also it's separated. Separated, though. yeah. So it's like at one school, you have this school, and this is the European school, and then you have this other school, and this is the multicultural school. It's like Ackley Bridge. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 like a divide within the same place. And it's very, very odd. Mm. Um, it, yeah, in London, you didn't get that. The weird thing was, so like when I grew up in... Uh, where I grew up in South London, like I faced racism up until I was about eight years old. Because mm-hmm. it was unacceptable to call, you know, um, black people, black people, white people, white people. It was unacceptable for you to say those terms, but because I'm mixed race, I didn't know what to call me. Mm. And I wasn't your typical mixed race, like because it is, you know, Irish, Indian, Caribbeans who I associate my ethnicity around. And they didn't know what to call me, so they kept calling me like the P word, um, Spick, which is a Spanish, uh, mm-hmm. like Latino insult. Uh, the correct term is culi, mm-hmm. which is like indentured labourer slave term for of someone of Asian descent. Yeah, they never caught like they would call me all these things until uh, a thing in this country called show racism the red card happened. Okay, and our school was closely linked to Millwall, and Millwall is a troubled football team, like historically. Mm. Not anymore, they do a lot of like um, community work, the fans need a little bit more work. Um, but then as soon, like it stopped, it was amazing. And it, so explain to me what show racism the red card was. Was it, it to do with football? It was to do with football. So there's a okay. lot of uh, football hatred towards uh, diversity players and okay. diversity fans. So uh, football, the FIFA Association put like stopped to it and showed, that, like started in the '90s and it like ro- like what's the snowball effect did up until like the early noughties and it's still a thing going on. Show racism the red card. Yeah. And it's basically. If you're racist, get out, you're banned from being associated with our club. And that translated, that translated. into society. So a, a thing that happened within the football league like mm. association actually changed the course of society's acceptance. Yeah. That is so fascinating. But it changed it in cities. So when I went to Canterbury yeah. for a university, um, I said oh you know my mum's an immigrant and one of the girls who clearly hadn't grown up in a city lifestyle went just go home then oh okay and I was like what and this is a few years ago this is university time yeah and she's like 18 yeah okay and I was like god damn and then somebody who did my course um was saying about this um Asian boy on the course saying oh I couldn't have kids with him because our kids would look weird I was like hang on a second my grandma was white and my granddad was Asian and my mum is a beautiful woman Mm. and I'm beautiful. What are you saying? And she's like, no, you look fine. You look normal because you look white. And I was like, what? (laughs) What I was like, oh God. This is like so intriguing for me. It's Kent, man. It's not just Blackburn that are a little bit... Mm. And like, it's just, it's little pockets up and down the country that just need a little bit of diversity love. I feel like England is the only country in the world where a football association can come up with an idea, an initiative, you know, a way of thinking, employ that into the club and it have a direct impact on society. Because football is such an integral part of your culture. But yeah, it's not just like the football, like FIFA themselves. Like uh, Paddy Power did an amazing campaign where they did the rainbow laces. Okay. Paddy Power is a betting company betting for company. Australian yeah. listeners. Yep. Right. Continue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, Paddy Power is like doing uh, these silly off the wall promotions mm-hmm. or campaigns. So this, uh, what they did is they sent rainbow laces to every single major football team in the country saying for the rest of this week you are to wear rainbow laces to highlight um, uh, acceptance of LGBT yeah so LGBTQ plus like in the whole of February and it went like it transcended all the way to match of the day we now wear them at university during varsities like it's still a thing now yeah it's a massive massive thing and those those type of things can change the course or the way of thinking it of people. It changes perceptions. Absolutely. What I really enjoyed uh, was walking through Piccadilly Gardens the other week and seeing a bunch of 
um, anti-racist, anti-fascist, and like campaigners against the EDL people that were marching through. And I saw it as a complete and utter waste of police resources because so many police were put out into the street to protect these people that do that aren't advocating to protect anybody. They want everyone that is not them to go down. No Muslims, no no people that aren't white, no people that don't have shaved heads. Like they just they have this idea. It's almost like a Nazi Germany type situation, and they have to take up police resources and police time to be protected so they can put on a small display in Manchester. But you realise it's not the police protecting those people for the EDL, the police are just protecting freedom of speech. Mm. They're not actually protecting those people, they're just protecting a fundamental democratic right. Yeah. Yeah. I just I just got frustrated, but what I did like was the fact that the amount of um, protesters or the amount of campaigners for the EDL was around about 20. Um, for Australian listeners, EDL is English Defence League. Um, think One Nation, but super extreme. Um, basically, that's an Australian political party that's very, not very similar, but they bang on about Ban the Burka and, and all the rest and, you know, similar type of thing. Yeah, because um, there was that person who came into your, well, one of your um, members of parliament came into uh, parliament with a burqa as a joke. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah. Oh I know. my God. Just... That was, that's Pauline Hanson. She's the leader of One Nation. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. She is an interesting character. Mm. Um, but oh, yeah. these, these political figures that are able to get airtime and able to get people to listen and support them and then go out in the streets and campaign and waste resources when they, when they face counter-protest and they face people that don't agree with, with what they're saying... And it's just a complete and utter waste of time. Mm. Like, you know. Oh, my mum did make me laugh. Bear in mind, she, like, she was born in Ireland, grew up in the Caribbean, so I can't do her accent because it's a, like, strong Irish accent (laughs) with a Caribbean twinge. (laughs) She wants to meet all of you, and she's, I love her to pieces, but I can't trust her. What do you mean? I just can't trust her with comedians. So there's a... uh, upcoming comedian called Saskia or known as Twix um, I don't know what stage name she wants to go by now at the moment um, and she does uh, comedy virgins back in London and when I first did it three years ago like my, she was hosting it and my mum said a couple of words to her and then my mum went back for a night uh, I wasn't there I was doing my own gig but my mum went to go see it now Saskia doesn't know my mum Saskia mm. meets a lot of people yeah. and my mum goes up to her and goes I remember you and I'm like, oh shit, come in. I'm like, mom, what's happened? And then she drags me straight to Saskia, goes, this is my daughter. And then Saskia, I don't think likes me. Yeah. And just goes, oh, she's your mum. And I'm like, I'm really sorry. Oh, I don't God. know what's happened. Now, parents parents can be weird. Like, you can't be getting too hung up on what your mum's going to say. But bring her to Manchester. I reckon we'd have a laugh. She loves Manchester. Yeah. She loves it up here. Get her up. Get her to Giggle Gang, mate. I, I would, but I've got to basically send her back home because I've got work on Monday. Oh. Yeah. She's not, maybe, maybe if there's a bank holiday. Yes. Yeah. That'll be fun. That will be good. So tell me about what life was like growing up for you because you talk about it a bit in your set. Obviously, your mum and dad are no longer together. They weren't together from when I was well, born. Yeah, they, they, they weren't together. And you, you have some pretty choice things to say about your dad. So we don't, we don't need to get into that. But what was life like? with like growing up as a kid were you always like trying to make people laugh and very creative or were you quite reserved uh, so i remember telling a christmas joke when i was about six years old to my dad because i just found like one of the old cracker jokes and i just thought oh that's funny I read it to my dad and my dad pulled me over and just went it's about timing but the problem is i just done something to my mum and i don't remember what i'd done yeah and she comes in and she goes, and he's like, off on one, like, absolutely crazy. And you know what parents say, like, does it look like I've got stupid written on my forehead? Yeah. And I just went, I just turned to her and went, no, your forehead's not big enough. Maybe the word mad could fit on it. And my dad pissed himself with laughter, and then my <laughs> mum ended up slapping him. <laughs> 
So I learnt my lesson very quickly that it was about situation and timing. Yeah, that's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> that's all it is. And my mum's blowing up, that's the time to cut her down. Yeah. Like, when she's when she's flying high on the on the thrill of anger, yeah. that's the time to really just smack the knees out from under her. I'd always been a little sass mouth shit. I can only imagine. Oh my God. <laughs> What was what was school like for you? Were you getting in trouble at school? No, um, goody two shoes. I wasn't a goody two shoes. I was a sass mouth, but the problem was I was an old soul. Mm. So all the kids are like watching uh, your CITV and stuff, and I'd come in quoting L O L O, which is um, an old eight nineteen eighties or seventeen eighties um, program sitcom about uh, the Second World War. Yeah. So they're all English accent actors doing terrible accents to pretend to be the other like the other nations that were involved in the war okay and um like that's one of my favorite sitcoms ever but i'd come in quoting stuff like that to the teachers and they'd think that's absolutely hilarious yeah and the kids look used to look at me like well, you're a weirdo yeah why aren't you watching pokemon and bloody my little pony i didn't watch my little pony but i did love pokemon but pokemon i think was sick. pokemon was the tits <laughs> <laughs> So, like, did you, because you were like that, did you sort of, like, keep to yourself and do your own thing? I don't know. I did a little bit. And, like, if I had friends, like, it would be cool and whatever. But I never, I was never a conformist. Mm. And I think that caused me a lot of problems as a kid. Because mm. I was, I never wanted to be popular. I just wanted to go on and do my own thing. Mm. Do you feel like you liked the idea of breaking rules or doing things because like you you did something different because everyone else was doing something else yeah like yeah. that's that's when i discovered i had my own voice because i was breaking a serious rule mm. at um school so we were we were punished like no pe lesson no whatever and i i knew my mom was training me on my human rights because like as much as the school education system was giving me an education, it was fucking shit. Yeah. So I was being homeschooled at the same time and I was, you know, I was never sent to nursery. Like my siblings would teach me their own thing. We used to have a game called You Be The Judge. Yeah. And it was all based on the English law system. So I was playing that from the age of eight. A game that you play at home? Yeah. Okay, right. And um, so I knew like some of my human rights and I thought, well, you know what, like I need exercise. Otherwise we've been incarcerated like, like prisoners mm. bear in mind I'm nine years old at the time mm. uh, arguing this with the teacher he's like just sit down write a letter but he, he stupid stupid Tony Simpson <laughs> said to us tell us what tell me what you think of me I was like okay like, like write it down in a letter write it down so. why would you do that at what point did he think that was a good idea uh, I, the, point, the DVD player must have been broken in the class like you know, no no this was like we weren't allowed PE so we had to sit and write in the scorching hot sun on the tarmac so we were burning our skin I don't think you can ever tell me about scorching hot sun okay I know I can't but <laughs> scorching hot British sun okay that's better and <laughs> so it's about 25 degrees yeah it's about 25 degrees <laughs> <laughs> People in Australia are laughing their <laughs> fucking heads off as they rub Savlon on their burnt feet. <laughs> we used to have to like go outside on like a square piece of tarmac and just sit on hot concrete for hours every morning. I mean, tell that to the Rangers. Mate, I know. Yeah. Rangers in Australia are a dying breed. <laughs> they're all dying. Um, yeah. They're like beluga whales. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but so tell me tell me what you think of me tell me what you think what of me. did you think oh I thought some very 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 harsh terms now please bear in mind I was a really political child okay. so at the time like Jamie Oliver was doing his thing like statistics were coming out that one in three children who are obese yeah and I was like like writing this letter I you know I shouldn't have called him a son of a bitch and a fucking asshole I did okay and, like, and you were nine yeah. Okay. Cool. I was like, you you are a son of a bitch. Full stop. Okay. I think you are a fucking comma asshole. Full stop. Yeah. It is teachers like you that make one in three children obese in this country. Full stop. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was, was basically basic grammar. Yeah. It was, <laughs> but it was also insults as well. It wasn't like constructive. You 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 knew what you wanted to say, but you didn't quite have the language to articulate it at the time. I think fucking arsehole is a great way to describe Tony Simpson. But, but I still I still believe it. Like I I don't care if you're listening, Tony Simpson. You are a son of a bitch. Full stop. 
and a fucking comma asshole. Full stop. But when you're trying to give feedback like that to someone, don't you feel like instead of saying asshole and and, and cunt and, and all the rest of the insults that you can do, you can actually break down exactly why you're frustrated with him? Not when you're nine years old. Yeah, I know. But what I'm saying is now. You now I can. That. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, afterwards I can definitely explain why I. I would like so I educated myself a lot more on the situation um, because I came out of it sent, dropped my letter and was like well there you go you fucking deserve it mm. you cunt I didn't say that in my head I did yeah. uh, went to class and he put, it was like Scarlett come back out here pulled me aside I was like what is this letter and he's like I was just like this is exactly what you told me to write you said what do you think of me and this is what I think mm. you, you're punishing me and I didn't do anything wrong and you're a fucking asshole for it mm. I did say it that time yeah. and he was like I won't tell anyone I promise but you should be more like your sister okay. and that broke me why? why why should you be more like your sister exactly I don't want to be anything like my but sister but what man. was your sister like she was a goody two shoes she, conformist yeah man yeah yeah and she'd just go with the flow she, she was a very very placid child okay. very calm okay and you were defined I was just outspoken. I wasn't exactly defined. Like, I'd go with the flow, but if something's wrong, I'm going to, you know, a spade is a spade. I'm going to call it a spade. Like, I'm going to fucking call it out. Yeah. Do you feel like as well, like, you talk a lot on stage about how difficult life is being a woman, basically. <laughs> sort, of your, sort, of, sort of your theme. When, at what age did you realise that that was a thing, that you were different? The year after and Tony Simpson again. Really? Oh, yeah. Fucking How did I know these two would be? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what happened. Uh, we were on a school trip and literally equality. 15 boys, 15 girls. Okay, beautifully equal. Beautifully equal class. Went to go get some chips. He got them for the boys. The girls were just sitting around. All the boys were scavenging at the chips. And I was just like, hang on a second. Like, but why couldn't you have the chips? I was like, that's what I was calling him out. And I was like, Tony. Did, did he give you a justification? It gets better. I was okay. like, Tony. Uh... Are you not going to get the girls any chips? Because if you're not, you're being sexist. Yeah. And he turned around and said, for that, because you called me sexist, no girls are getting chips. And then the girls turned on me. Interesting. And I was just like, bitches, man. (laughs) Do you find it easier to get on with other girls? I find it easier to get on with other girls on my wavelength. Mm -hmm. I like... I I know I identify as a as a female, mm-hmm. and I identify myself doing you know uh, societal female things like putting on makeup, wearing heels, stuff like that. I feel comfortable. That's when I, that's what I want to do. Yeah, but I don't typically class myself as doing like the girly girl things, mm. and you know the the girls who are like the the prima donna girls, the popular girls at school. I never identified with, and I never got on with them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, girls who are just a bit more down to earth. So I don't I don't know if it's just about girls. I kind of relate more to personality. Okay. But if, you know, if you happen to be a girl and you've got a great personality, then you are going to get on. If you have to be a guy with a great personality, we're going to get on. Yeah. And then you've also got the same with both as well in, in the opposite direction. Do you feel like now the, the way that the world is going, and you're obviously quite prolific on social media, putting things on Instagram stories and mm. that sort of thing. Do you think that's made it easier for you to connect with other people or harder? A lot easier. But if I did that on Facebook, I get a lot more shit for it. Mm-hmm. When I have done it on Facebook and I have put stuff on Facebook, I got shot down. Mm-hmm. Um, so I put it on the Instagram community and I get a lot more stories I get feedback not just from people who've experienced it themselves people who are sympathizing from it people like of from across the world just speaking to me and just being like what how is this how, how is it affecting you and it, it's touching me and this is my story mm. and it's it's not a story that should be shared it's not a story that not like shared I am happy to share it, but it's not a shared connection. It shouldn't be something that we can all relate to. Yeah, because it shouldn't... It, it in shouldn't that happen. particular situation, yeah, it shouldn't happen. So although you're getting people coming back saying, yeah, that happened to me, I understand what you're saying, it almost frustrates you to the point being like, why is it happening? It's not just me, it frustrates. It's mm. frustrating everyone. And I'm not just saying the women who've outreached to me. They're like, the guys have gone just... The, what the guys have... You know, even you've said... 
this doesn't happen. I don't see this happening because I don't treat women like this. Yeah, it was hard. It was hard for me to believe and also hard for me to understand. And I did say to you yesterday, like, I can't understand or get my head around what life must be like just basically being almost disrespected and devalued to the point where your your personal opinion and what 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 is the essence of you really doesn't matter and you're just treated as as an object basically pretty much and that's that's not a life that i live i wouldn't even say that sometimes you get treated like an object because an object is an inanimate thing you get treated like a too much talking way too much opinionated living fleshlight Mm. (laughs) <laughs> that's why they invented flashlights. that's though. why they invented flashlights, but they didn't invent women to be them that's... no <laughs> I wanted to ask you this is this is interesting right mm. I was watching a documentary the other day about sex robots right yeah have you got any experience with sex robots no of course not no no but like no, like knowledge, knowledge. Of them. sorry okay. experience right. is the wrong word <laughs> <laughs> well uh... Scarlett's like yeah I've got three at home <laughs> Greg Craig and Phil <laughs> They're, they're all builders. <laughs> <laughs> no, what do you what what's your opinion on them? Um, well, me and my friend at university, we were talking, and she showed me. She showed me. I think it's a thing for girls. It's like a black box thing. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a little bit you can sit on that can go a little bit in you, and it really vibrates. And she was showing me the porn, and these girls were like passing out from orgasm, and I'm like, holy shit! Yeah. What? No. Yeah. Oh god, that's too much. Like I, I feel like my vagina is a manual stick shift right. kind of one. Because I know you get automatic cars, and like you just shift that into place and broom there you go and that's like the ones with like the vibrators and all the sex toys and the stuff vibrations and shit mine now nah, you gotta you gotta do some manual put some work into it yeah i don't even think i've got like the what you know, is it cruise control steering power steering power, nah i've not got power steering man my my vagina is not like that your vagina is a 1998 toyota corolla yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it just run out of power steering fluid yeah like. <laughs> So, what about because in this documentary, right? They were they were talking to men, lonely men that have gone and purchased female sex dolls. Mm. And one woman's concern is that if sex dolls that can talk to you and they can have real haptic feedback, so basically you touch them and they go, "Oh, baby, that feels nice." Like it's actually talking to you. And this woman is like, "It's going to completely devalue women to men." Was her opinion and was basically like. Once sex dolls become so realistic, why would you bother having the stress, the up and down and the emotions of a relationship when realistically all these people are looking for is that physical connection and they can get that as well as verbal connection from a robot rather than a real person? Because you still want it from a real person because you're talking about the ups and downs. Yeah. You want the up. You don't want it just to be mundane, the same. Mm Mm-hmm. So I can get myself a vibrator. I can definitely go get myself a dildo. Life would be so much more simple if I could be satisfied with a dildo. Okay. (laughs) It's it's not going to be because, you know, I want want the ups and downs. You want the ups and downs. Do you feel like as well the, 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 the statement, the highs are never good if you don't experience the lows? I agree with it in the sense of like morals in like ourselves and how we treat people but not in the sense of religion and that so i know they like what's in in the sense of religion because they always say oh um you have to suffer to like repent your sins to know that when god loves you it's all good and stuff so i went to catholic school and that's what they always used to tell us like if you're going through bad times this because jesus loves you i'm like bitch no yeah no i know there's some religious people listening to this podcast i'm sorry uh, I mean, you have an opinion. Never yeah. backtrack on this podcast. Okay. I'm Unapologetically not, Scarlet. I, I was saying, because I'm sorry, like, you can believe in God, but I believe in facts and mm. myself. Mm-hmm. So I can't believe in that. Good. Never backtrack ever on this podcast. That is one rule that I have. Aye, aye, Matty Shaw. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also as well, this is this is going to take it to a dark place, but I'm interested to see mm. what you think, right? One one woman on this sex doll podcast, um, documentary thing said that rape will increase if sex dolls become more popular because basically with these inanimate objects these dolls people are able to fill out 
you know, fantasies and things they might not be able to do with a real person. However, once they get stale with a doll, they're going to go and search to have that with a real life person. And someone or not a lot of people may want to consent to that. And then you're going to get an unconsensual relationship. Do you agree with that or not? I can see exactly where she's coming from. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to say 100% agree, but yeah, I'm swaying more. You know when you get like the scale of, do you strongly agree, likely agree, indifferent? I think I'm on the likely agree to that one. But I think like the way sex is taught, it's taught to be more male favouring, Mm -hmm. especially even in like the porn industry. We've banned like face sitting and female orgasms in the British sex industry like in the porn and when did this happen oh god it happened it happened when i was back at university they're like face sitting protests outside of parliament so there's a load of people sitting on people's faces outside of parliament hang on what 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 is the protest so a woman sitting on a man's face outside of parliament in parliament has, has Square. been banned in british pornography yeah you're not allowed to face it and you're not allowed to show a female orgasm why and exactly why why That's are we so not puzzling. allowed why are we not allowed to show our pleasure yeah because of, like orgasms are fucking great they're not like a guy's orgasm is great but a woman's one oh boy <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> jackpot <laughs> that's all i'm saying on that so who who were the campaign is to get rid of it they, they it wasn't to get it was it was to basically highlight to government because at the time they were going to vote it through and it had been voted through so to ban it, to ban it. Ban it. Okay. and they uh, got outside parliament and there was just a load of women sitting on guys faces right. outside of outside of parliament where they used to have um, the like protest square okay. and loads of loads of cameras it was quite funny but why but did they... parliament want to ban it what was the exactly. motivation? I, I don't know okay. I, don't, I don't know i think mainly because parliament isn't a representative 50/50 of gender equality mm-hmm. um, and even then i think some of the old diddery doers would be like, oh no, I don't want to see a female orgasm. Orgasms are a thing of the, you know, made up mythical creatures like unicorns. Yeah. Um, I just think it got, I think it got banned because there's not enough education into, I think sex hasn't been favouring of women because for women it can be painful. Yeah. It can be demoralising and it can also be the greatest thing. But it's all about the consent, the conversation, the connection, the moment. Yeah. And it, it, that, that has not been taught. When you, get, when you get taught sex education, it's literally penis and vagina, go in, guy come, baby come out. Yeah. There's nothing of, you know, this is the woman's vagina, this is the clitoris, this is, you know, how you consent or the moments to create. I don't know. I, like, you know, I'm not a sex expert fully. I wouldn't say I'm a sex expert at all. Like I'm so, <laughs> I am so single right now. I think my head giving skills have depleted. Like everything's just gone to shit. I'm you, so fucking hairy. I've had, like, I've, <laughs> I've had a lot of women on this podcast. Well, not a lot of women, but a, a fair <laughs> smattering of women. And um, I think you're the first single woman I've had on the podcast. <laughs> and, uh, it hasn't taken you long to go into uh, the ramblings of uh, of how, a mad single yeah, woman. Well, no, just 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 the uh, the absolute delight of the female orgasm I yeah. mean, it hasn't taken you long to get to that I haven't point. had the, the delight of a single female orgasm since June since June since June okay. well I mean like I've had one for myself okay and that's how I'm surviving okay <laughs> but um no like even I went up to Edinburgh and I had sex I didn't just go up to Edinburgh specifically to have sex I was at that the fringe. is what that just sounded yes. like yeah <laughs> I was at the fringe uh, this year and yeah, did just yeah, fucked a guy that I'd been fucking for a while. That was like the last time I'd ever see him. Yeah. Uh, you know the guy that I put on my Instagram all the that was him. Okay. Um and yeah, he didn't even give me an orgasm then because he was a selfish fuck. Right. <laughs> and yeah. So I think this is gonna be a nice transition into your <laughs> opinions on dating. Um, and dating in 2018 because you are quite a prolific dater. Um, you seem to set <laughs> set a lot of dates, um, but I think you you had a bit of, a bit of trouble um, sort of these people following through on the dates and you've been stood up a few times. Uh, I'm a prolific like setter upper of daters. Yeah, and I prolifically get stood up all the time. Why do you think that is? 
I, I think I'm just too too much, really. Do you think it is to do with you? Yeah, I do. Or do you not think it's to do with the fact that online dating, things like Tinder, Bumble, Plenty of Fish, people are talking to so many people at the one time that all the faces and names on that screen really mean nothing to them. So it gets to the point and they look at it and obviously they're very self-absorbed because they're single, so it's it's every man for themselves. And they look at that screen and they go, I'm supposed to go and meet this girl who's 23, her name's Scarlett, she reckons she's from Catford. Look at it and just be like, nah, there's another one just below her that I can talk to. Do you think it's that utter disconnection that leads to people being stood up, people just being disrespected, guys just going on there just being like, fuck you, and then I'm gone. I mean, I feel so empty inside after that description, Matty, now. I feel so lost. In why, the do world. You, why, why do you feel empty, though? You literally just, like, you said exactly what it, what it is. But you also did call me 23, and I'm really happy you did that, because I'm 26 next month. Okay, that's fine. You can be whatever age you want. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, it's true. Like, there is such a disconnect. And I don't like Tinder. I literally go on it if I'm very, 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 very bored. Mm -hmm. That is the statement from a lot of women that I speak to, is they go on it when they're bored, and blokes go on it all the time. But blokes go on it. Blokes go on it like fishing in the Irwell, right? You would never want to eat any fish fish you would get out of that river and the likelihood of you catching a fish out of that river is pretty slim however if you dedicate six hours to sit down there and fish and you catch one fish you're like i've been here for a while i might as well just eat it yeah (laughs) that's why the app plenty of fish makes me laugh because they're all terrible um everyone on there (laughs) The, the horrible thing is, is that that's now like a quarter of how people meet each other. Mm. That's so, so bad. Mm. So if you just want to get a chance of even like, I'm not saying I want to meet someone. I'm very happy to be single. Mm-hmm. But you know, every now when I've got a night off from comedy, Jesus Christ, I want to, I want to snog. Mm. Like I haven't had, I have not been kissed since like since August now. I, I go, come on, give a girl a kiss. <laughs> Problem is. All I know is either work people or comedians. Yeah. And no thank you. (laughs) How do you feel in your position as a strong, opinionated woman in the Manchester comedy scene? (laughs) Um, I think I'm not the only one. Okay. I think there is a surge. And I mean, we saw it uh, this year at the Fringe with lots of the um, best in shows and best newcomers were women. Yeah. Um, And I think tide's about to change and rightly so yeah yeah do you feel like it's been something that's like hard in a sense that like i think i was talking to ellie pollard about this in regards to like women being attracted to comedy and women have technically a nurturing mothering nature and that's why jobs in teaching and jobs in care like nursing they attract women and jobs in manual labor aggression strength attract men construction military those type of things whereas comedy is not masculine but it is also not feminine but comedy was a freedom of speech thing so men were afforded a freedom of speech they can say what they want they can be disrespectful and get away with it but women weren't allowed to speak and that why it's sort of skewed that way although it's not masculine or feminine mm. it's a it's a speech and it's a listening it also depends on what the style of comedy is because superiority theory does favor masculinity in that mm-hmm. sense but uh, women use comedy for bonding mm. so men use comedy to show status women use comedy for bonding we we use we use humor in different means in different ways i use comedy for bonding yeah but you know what I mean, like in the terms of general masculinity, yeah. general fe- femininity. I get you. I get you. I just really need some friends. That's what I'm really mm. searching for. Um, <laughs> so, what is what is the plan for you? Obviously, you've been in comedy now. Is it three years you've been doing comedy? I wouldn't say three. I mean, I have been doing it for three years, but I was so so lazy. I don't think it actually counts. Okay. When did you start taking it seriously? I started taking it seriously this year in March. Okay. Right. So it, almost identical time to me. Yeah. Basically, exactly the same. Time. Time. And, and where do you see it going for you? I will push for it. Like I'm just. But what? What is it? What do you want? I want to be just known either as a stand-up or a funny person. Okay. I don't want to be seen. I, I do want my name to be known. Oh, Scarlett, she's funny. Yeah. Because that's you know, at, I wasn't. 
that funny kid at school, but I was the funny kid to the teachers. Yeah. Okay. And you mentioned as well that you were an old soul, and uh, yesterday we recorded a radio show, and you could not stop talking about knitting. Who got you into knitting? Brownies and my grandma. Okay. Yeah. What was brownies like? Explain it to me. Oh, do you know? Do you guys have like? We have girl guides. Gu- it was like, it's like girl guides. Yeah, I know. I know what brownies is, but I obviously was never allowed to join. Um, well, it's just basically the girl version of scouts okay. or boy guides or whatever you call them. I don't know. I was never involved in any. Of it. We had we did boys brigade, but it was it was shit. It wasn't yeah. that great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I did uh, I did Navy Cadets as well. We used That's to go sailing. That's so cool. Yeah, I was uh, I was a cool kid back in school. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> I was so painfully boring. Um, but like, what was it like surrounding yourself with a group of other girls? I assume who were all sort of thinking the same way. Oh no, these girls weren't thinking the same way. So oh. that we had to do like choose a community project uh-huh. and um, I chose to do knitting and the other girls who did choose to do the same thing would give their knitting to their grandma. Right. So they'd come in with like five squares and go, okay, I don't need to do this, I'm gonna go play. Mm-hmm. And I would sit there and I'm like, no, I'm gonna learn to do this skill. It's a life skill, I'm gonna need it. And um, it just helped me and my grandma. So my grandma wasn't local to me. She lived down in Brighton. So I'd see her once every two months. And me and her would just sit there and knit. And it was just a little bonding thing. And then when I um, got a little bit older, I spent a fair bit of my school holiday with her in Brighton. And we'd just sit there knitting. And me and me and me and all her little old friend dears used to go out for lunch and dinner and talk about the knitting and the gardening. And yeah, <laughs> I've never seen you so happy talking about anything else. I love my grandma. No, I'm not saying you don't love your grandma, but like, do you feel like you can't wait to get to the age that matches how you feel? If that makes sense. I don't think my grandma is at the age that she feels because mm. I, I don't actually think. I think we're all children just pretending to be adults. Yeah, and I th- like genuinely this. My grandma is god near 80 now and she lives life like she is the most vital like is the word vitality Vita- like, yeah she's she's full of it like uh, she's like a 20 year old like springing around the place mm. i mean she's like you know a bit hobbly here and there yeah. a bit fragile yeah She's doing that. My my other grandma who passed away last year, she was exactly... She was working up until she was 80. She was a nurse up until she was 80. Mm. She lied about her age. Mm. She hid her um, NI card. I think she frauded it as well. <laughs> I wouldn't put it past Grandma Rose to do that. <laughs> she... <laughs> you literally just dropped her in it. <laughs> She's dead. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> There's nothing anyone can do. If anything, she was frauding herself because she refused her pension. Oh, my God. She was like tough nut Irish cookie yeah and do you feel like that's where you've gotten some of your work ethic from like those those strong women that you've seen oh in your yeah life? my grandma definitely like but they're both called grandma but like my mum's mum definitely installed like she said if somebody doesn't like you and this is such a thing in comedy if someone doesn't like you you hold your head up high you walk into that room you do what you need to do and you walk out with your head even higher yeah Absolutely. Because again, in in this experience that is life, you're going to meet some people that don't like you and they don't like what you have to say and they don't like the way you think because it's just different to them. And they're very scared to either try and see it from your perspective or very scared that maybe you're right. And it's yeah. like, oh, shit. Yeah. It just feels uncomfortable. Oh, maybe he's, maybe he's got a point. Maybe she knows what she's talking about. Maybe I don't know anything. Oh, no, push it away. Push it away. Mm. You're, like, you, you're terrified to see from someone else's perspective because maybe they might have it and you don't. Yeah. It's not even that you're terrified to see it from the perspective. It's terrified that this is your perspective because a lot of comedy is done to the crowds that you bring in. Yeah. So, and it's like your crowd, your, you know, you're like-minded, but nothing ever challenges anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of boring. It's kind of stagnant, but that's what happens. So, like, uh, back in the 80s, it was alternative comedy. It was genuinely what it should be, alternative comedy. You come up, you say, you write original material. It's... It's vibrant, it's free, and now 
you go to the comedy store, you're paying £24 for best in show. You're slicking down all of your best material, filleting it to it's basically nothing, and you get paid like 800 quid for the week. Mm. It's capitalism. Capitalism has ruined it again. Mm. So you just bring in a crowd, they listen to your shit, they go home. Nothing actually makes you provocatively think. Yeah. Do you feel like that's what you try to do, is try to give like the audience a lesson or a thought or an idea to reflect on? I want to do that. Um, Anna Spark said something very, very poignant with me, though. As a comedian, you are not the moral. You are the punchline. Mm. And that has kind of... like That's something that I w- really wish someone said to me when I was actually doing this at university back in the day because I used to go off on like long rant, long, long rants like George Carlin mm-hmm. and George Carlin got like round of applause because he was in America and Americans whoop for fucking anything mm. but here you actually if you're going to say something and make a point you also have to be so clever and so intricately funny mm. and I'm, I'm, I've learned that the hard way now mm. and now I'm really like aiming to write like that mm. So where would you say like the next 12 months for you because let's let's focus 2018 mm. you've really started to take comedy seriously what is the next step for you and the next plan over say the next 12 months Well I've got to finish off my first solo show because I started it uh in March to perform this June mm-hmm. and I was very happy with that so I'm going to finish that off by the end of this year even if I'm in America finishing it off um, and then I will be redoing that back in June in Catford Fringe. I've got to hit up other fringe festivals. Mm-hmm. Then, so that's my solo show done, wrapped up, and I'll keep on adding to bits to it, editing it, so that in like three to five years' time, I can then take that to Edinburgh as my first ever solo show. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to get a really, really solid 20 mm-hmm. so that. Co- clubs can't turn me away mm. you can't physically you can't you can't say nah she's she's no good she's this she's that you know you gotta go right okay you've you got a point you've got something to say go and get on stage and here's money for it mm. I also need to learn um, audience interactions I'm really bad at trusting people yeah. and I think like conversation is so flowing and I forget that comedy is just a conversation yeah and I just need to trust an audience. And even if they go off off the wall, because my conversations are always off the fucking wall. I throw all sorts of shit into a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to trust people to be either as crazy as me or I just need to trust people mm. a little bit, like audiences. How do you think you're going to get to trust audiences? Practice. Okay. Practice makes perfect. And that's what that's what the plan is. Yeah, is practice. Practice. I mean, I just since coming up here in London, the scene is so stagnant. You've got to take somebody to a gig, so you're ruining both people's. You're ruining your evening by doing a, sh- a show that might be really shit for you. That would bring down your self esteem. You're ruining your friends' evening because you're taking them out from like a chill evening at home after a hard day's work. You've got to buy alcohol in the venue. You're getting treated like shit by other comments because they're not even recognizing your existence. All this crap. You come up to Manchester, you have a ball of a time, you have a community, you have an audience, Mm. you have people who want you to do good. They don't want you to threaten them and they don't want you to ruin their night. They want just the best for you. And if you are a London comic, please ignore everything I've just said. I don't want you up here. There's no backtracking on this podcast. (laughs) There's no backtracking. It's not a backtrack. It's me just basically saying... Don't come up here. I'm having a great time. Yeah. Fuck you. You yeah. can stay in London. That's it. That's yeah. exactly what I need. You to chose to be in London. That's right. You fucking stay in London yeah. with your shitty comedy community. That's right. I really just shot myself in the foot from now on. No London bookers ever going to book me ever again. But you know Fuck what? Fuck London, you. Mate. Fuck you guys. You don't like, need there's the rest of the country. You've got Blackburn. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> when this goes out, fuck it. I said it. Fuck London, man. Beautiful. Fuck it. Well, I think that is the perfect way to end the <laughs> podcast. I think we have almost done an hour. never getting booked again. That is exactly what I wanted out of this. <laughs> you know me. I love to watch you suffer. <laughs> Scarlett, where can people follow you on the socials to see where you're gigging and what's happening in your life? Uh, please follow me on Instagram at Scarlett Dobson Comedy, at Scarlett with two Ts. And that's the same on Facebook. I don't have a Twitter. Mm-hmm. I won't have a Twitter. 
for a while and if I do it will literally just be my Instagram photos so it'll mm. be me on stage or of my cats yeah yeah thrilling life you have mm-hmm. <laughs> it's fun eh? <laughs> you having fun yeah I'm having yeah. fun yeah how can you not how can you hate this life <laughs> that is like that is my favourite thing how can you I, hate this life I can't hate northern life London life I hated here that's it but that's if life's life. shit just do something about it exactly <laughs> that's why I moved up and I've now got fairy lights around my room mate look at you go yeah. you're, you're thriving <laughs> <laughs> thriving in the sea well look thank you so much for coming on Scarlett um, I don't know who's going to be on the next episode but we shall figure it out any final words for the fans how many fans are there heaps heaps yeah I've no got specific. I've got one in my bedroom my housemate has one and then we have one in the lounge room as well oh. you have to plug them in though they're oh, not okay. on today yeah I mean like I wouldn't plug it in anytime soon because it is October and it is cold so um, my words to the fan is uh, don't get plugged in mm. yeah. stay stay spinning <laughs> <laughs>